Okay, good afternoon. Can you all hear me at the back? Okay. Yeah. Sound volume okay? Good. Okay, well, as I was introduced, my name is Alistair Schofield. My background's actually in, in, in business, really, in uh, senior management roles in large organizations. I ended up in this field really because we started a, 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 a leadership development business, and we were looking for a tool that could help facilitate those sort of conversations with people around understanding themselves and understanding other people better. And what better way to actually get into the hardware of the brain, to actually start from the sort of the very DNA and the fabric of a person. Now, originally, I know that on the agenda, this is billed as uh, neuroscience and coaching. That's because I was told I was down to speak on that subject or in that, in that uh, session. But uh, then I found I was in storytelling. So I, so I really quickly rewrote the presentation around storytelling. But I think you'll find that they, they are, there are similarities, anyway, across these disciplines. Uh, but before we get into, into that, what I want to do is I want to tell you a story. Now, are you all sitting comfortably? Yes. yes. Then we shall begin. My story begins long, long ago on the eastern plains of Africa. When around about four million years ago, this creature called Australopithecus, which doesn't seem to work. <laughs> but no matter, I'll press the button. And that doesn't seem to work either. <laughs> At least it shows it's live. Uh, this creature, Australopithecus, emerged. Now, anthropologists regard this as our oldest ancestor, uh, not because it was one of the primates, but because it was the first creature to contain this specialist gene called SRGAP2, which has a complicated name, but which you could learn if you wanted to, to impress people. But the, what's interesting about this gene is it made neurons grow longer and more functional. So it's also implicated in the development of the synaptic network. So in effect, anthropologists regard our oldest ancestor based on its brain, not on its body or its appearance or the fact that it would walk on two legs or any of those other factors. It's his brain that was interesting, his background. Now, I'm going to ask you a question to make sure that after your lunch you're still awake. Why do you have a brain? <laughs> this is a tough one. Why do you have a brain? <laughs> For what? <laughs> to control all our activities. <laughs> all the activities, yeah. Anything else? <laughs> so that we don't sleep after lunch and try to keep away. Keep our body balance. Yeah, yeah. It's also so that you know that you've got a headache. Uh, at its very lowest level, sorry, one more suggestion? I never had a choice. <laughs> you didn't have a choice. Exactly. It was there when you woke up. Right. At its very lowest level, you have a brain because you move. It's as simple as that. In life, there are plenty of things that don't have brains. Trees don't have brains. They don't need a brain because they don't move. The world happens to them. The brain is so that you can interact dynamically with the world around you. Because otherwise you'd walk in front of cars or fall off cliffs or whatever. So it's that dynamic interaction is why you have a brain in the first place. However, let's break that down a bit. Because the brain does three fundamental things. It does instincts and habits, memory, and thinking. Now, the instincts and habits are your automatic functions, the things you don't have to think about. So things like controlling your body, as you suggested. Uh, things like walking, although you have to learn how to walk, you now do it automatically. It's an automatic function. It fits in this area. Catching a ball, throwing a spear, all of those things. Automatic instincts, straightforward things that we do. Memory, interestingly, seems almost limitless in humans. Uh, in terms of, this is about storing information, storing in, uh, your experiences, your life experiences, things that come to you. So hugely important. So uh, building that sort of bank of knowledge. And thinking is about dealing with change, dealing with newness when something unexpected happens. That's when you need to do thinking. Okay, reasonable? Yeah. yeah. Now, to put this in context, what I want to do is talk about. And what's happened since Australopithecus, but four million years is a difficult number to, to conceive of. So what I've done instead is I've condensed it into a 12-hour day. So let's imagine that we started on time. <laughs> so let's imagine that it was now 12 noon, and that Australopithecus emerged at 12 midnight. Let's see what happens over those, tw over those uh, four million years. Two hours later, the Stone Age began. We developed our first tools as creatures. Only 
36 minutes ago, we emerged. The sapiens. That's us. That's our species. It took almost 11 and a half hours of that brain development before we popped out onto the scene. It was only 7 minutes and 12 seconds ago that the very first cave paintings are found. Only 1 minute and 40 seconds ago, the first evidence of the first building emerged. A minute ago, the earliest writing, and only less than two seconds ago, the Industrial Revolution began. My point in going through this is that our brains can only change at the pace of evolution, but our world has changed at a revolutionary pace. And for the vast majority of the last four million years, we lived like this. We lived in caves, we lived in the forests, we uh, hunted for food, and really our only pri priorities in life were nourishment, uh, shelter, uh, warmth and safety. Was it really? We didn't have to worry about our iPhones better than Samsung, you know, or we didn't have to worry about whether whether I joined WhatsApp or not, you know, any of that sort of stuff. The complex world didn't hit us. Ninety-nine percent of our brain's evolution has been in this environment, and then in the last one percent of that time, we've gone from this, the very first cave painting, boom. This amazing world that we live in today, with all of its sophistication and complexity. Uh, so let's go back to this diagram here. I think, so for the vast majority of the last four million years, what was most important to us? Was it instinct, memory, or thinking? Instinct, yeah, of course it is. That gut reaction, yeah, we're living in a natural world. We've got to be at one with our world. What's second most important? Sorry? Yeah? Memory? Yeah. Memory. You know, where, where are the best places to go fishing? What season should I plant seed? Uh, which tribe should I avoid because they don't like us very much? You know, that sort of stuff. The, the, the stories handed down by our parents as well and other people to, to learn and build on that knowledge from. Frankly, that world didn't change very rapidly. It changed at the pace of the seasons. New stuff isn't happening all the time. So we're not really particularly challenged. We're not having to do that much thinking uh, in that sort of environment, right? Now, so if I put that into a sort of model for the vast majority of the last four million years, it's something like this. These percentages aren't expected to be accurate, they're just to give an idea. But for the majority of that time, the emphasis is on our instincts, uh, not, you know, our, and, and then our memory, and, and then our, our thinking capacity. So, if I relate this to the, to the brain, and this is where it gets quite interesting, actually. If you actually look at the brain, if, if, well, if you were able to, <laughs> and actually that's why I brought this one. So, this is, this is my porter brain that goes traveling with me. Uh, but actually, the funny thing is, the instincts that reside in this lower part of our brain, particularly the cerebellum. The cerebellum is sometimes called the hind brain or the baby brain, because it looks a bit like a, a little brain in its own right. In a human, 80% of your brain cells are actually in this part of the brain. It's funny, we're not even aware of what goes on down here. But 80% of your brain, in effect, by neuron count, is down, is down here. This is what deals with all of those basic instinct matters, regulating the temperature of your body, regulating the breathing rate, relative to the amount of oxygen you need at any point in time. Uh, it's doing the things like walking around. It's doing those sort of automated functions. Memory resides seemingly throughout the brain, particularly in the sort of cognitive areas, and seems to be distributed. Memory seems to be about association between different regions, putting things together, which is why it's difficult to memorize a string of numbers, but when it's a phone number and it's got an association with a person, it's those associations that they, the memory. And finally, there's this very interesting area at the front of the brain, sometimes called the frontal lobes, but more precisely known as the prefrontal cortex. This is the region of the brain that deals with thinking, Thinking is very interesting because thinking is quite limited in capacity. What to do is I like to do an exercise based on your cognitive capacity, your ability to think. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide you into two teams in this room. Okay, you're up for a competition. Yeah. Okay, so let's take this as the dividing line. Over here, I want you to count the basketball passes of the people wearing white T-shirts. Okay? And over here, I want you to count the basketball passes and be wearing black t-shirts. Simple. There's, some of you may have seen this video before. This is not a test in have you seen the video before. Okay? So when I switch it on, I don't want to hear, oh, I've seen this before. Okay? It's not a test, it's, uh, it's for a purpose. And it doesn't matter whether you've seen it before. 
can we try to do this also? I want you to also stay completely quiet while we're doing this because we re people really need to concentrate. In each team, there are three people. Three wearing black t-shirts, three wearing white t-shirts, and they're weaving in and out of each other. They never pass the ball to the other team, by the way. So it stays within them. But it's a bit more complicated than this. If I pass the ball to you, if I throw it to you, that's one, okay? If I bounce it, that's another one, okay? So if I throw it to you and bounce it off the floor, that's two, okay? Now, the other thing is, if you lose count partway through, don't worry, carry it, pick up from where you left off, because you're doing it as a team, okay? So you may be able to help them get closer to the answer. So, you're counting the passes of the team wearing white t-shirts, black t-shirts. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good response. All on your marks. Get set. Okay. What do you got? 34? 36. Okay. What do you got over here? 31. Okay. Right. Okay. Hands up if you saw the gorilla. Okay, you interesting. More people over here than over here. Okay, so I take from that the rest of you did not see the gorilla. That's good. It's always comforting when somebody doesn't see the gorilla. Right. Look, let me show you that again. Okay. What's happening here is you're committing this part of your brain, this cognitive capacity. You're thinking. <laughs> and thinking is a limited capacity capability within humans. So what happens is that you're concentrating on the basketball bass as you're counting, and I've made it a bit more complicated with the bouncers and all that stuff. And then on walks this man in a gorilla suit. He walks right through the middle of the group, beats his chest and walks up. He's been there for a full nine seconds, and yet some people don't see it. Now I have to say, if you're counting black t-shirts, you're more likely to spot the gorilla, because your professional vision is looking for the movement of black objects. If you're counting white, it's harder. But the reason is, the reason is you're overloading your brain with what you're doing. It's, it's filter capacity, so therefore you don't see. Which raises that question at work, how many times at work do you miss the gorilla? Because you're concentrating on something. On the other hand, if you're looking, spend all your day looking for gorillas, you're not going to get the work done. So, you know, a good point why we need different people. Some people looking out for white t-shirts and some people looking out for black t-shirts. Uh, now. Have any of you come across George Miller's work from the 19, 1956? He published a paper called Magical Num Numbers Mystery. Not Matt Miller, something. He called it called Magical Mystery 7. Yes? He was looking at working memory. He was looking at what is the capacity that a human being has for working memory. And he wrote a paper called Magical Mystery 7, plus or minus 2. He wasn't in marketing. Anyway. More recently, neuroscientists have uh, done work around cognitive capacity. So this is not working memory so much as, as almost how many balls can you juggle, how many thoughts can you manipulate in brain at one point in time. Any idea what that answer might be? Seven. Seven? Seven. Seven. Five. 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 It's only four. In fact, actually, these people had a sense of humor, which is unusual for neuroscientists, but, neuro but they had a sense of humor, and they actually wrote a paper based on the Beatles album and called it Magical Mystery Four. <laughs> plus or minus two. No, actually, plus or minus one, I think they said. What they said is, in exceptional circumstances, they might accept that it might go to five. The really fascinating thing about this is this is the same limitation that you find in chimpanzees and in the great apes. So it seems to be that there is a biological limitation to that uh, limitation on our cognitive capacity. Uh, it, you know, it, explaining why that might be is not the subject for today, but you can come and see me later if you want to understand more about that. It's quite a, quite a fascinating story. Humans overcome this by committing more stuff to this lower part of the brain, to our instincts and habits. What we do is we automate, we routinize functions. So think about the time, you know, when you were a baby, you didn't know driving was a thing. And then you got to be a toddler, and you saw mummy and daddy driving the car, and you thought, that's so interesting, I wonder how they do that, it looks kind of cool. You know, looking forward to when I can do that. And eventually you start learning to drive, and it's all a bit clunky, and you keep stalling, and you set off, and you remember you haven't taken the handbrake off, and things like that. You know, and then you have to concentrate. And if somebody interrupts you, you go, shh, quiet, I'm trying to drive. Whereas probably now, you probably drive to work, you're whistling a tune, you're listening to the radio, you're chatting to somebody on the telephone, even though you shouldn't, and you're doing all of these things all at the same time. You probably don't even remember the journey to work. Yeah?
because it's become a conscious, unconscious competence. You can do it, but you don't have to think about it, which frees up your mind to think about other things. Your brain is designed to stop thinking as quickly as it can. Why? Because thinking is an expensive resource, and it's very limited. So you, you habitualize processes, you automate those functions as much as you can to try to simplify it. Now, here's, here's the evidence. Some people a while ago did, uh, did some tests. They always do them on students, so they're, so they're always biased to students, because students are, you can afford students easily. A little bit of a bribe, and they're, they're up for it. So they wire them up, and they put them in a scanning machine, a positron emission tomography machine, and what they did is they gave them a task that they'd never done before. When they would perform that task for the first time, these areas of the brain light up. Look at that. The frontal lobes, obviously, because they've never done it before, so they're having to think about it. Yeah? And the right hemisphere lights up. The right hemisphere of the brain tends to deal with newness, novelty. When something's new, it's this side of the brain that gets involved. What they found, though, is when they perform the same task multiple times, what happens is it becomes practice, it becomes routine, only this side of the brain gets involved. In fact, what happens is that things, when they're new, they start at the front and the, and the right side, and they migrate over towards the rear left side as we routinize them, as we automate those processes. And this is, this is really good. Because what it means is we don't have to think about it. My, my favorite example is if you've got a lot of uh, guests coming around for, say, a fancy meal at your house, and you decide to do fold fancy napkins and water lilies and stuff like that, and you, so you download some instructions on the internet or whatever, the first one you do, you'll have to really think about. Yeah? But, but by the time you've done four or five, you're sort of like getting bored and you're, you're looking around, and you're probably doing a better job than you did on the first one but you don't have to think about it anymore, so, because you've freed up that, that capacity. That's, what's happening. That's the way our brains are designed to work. Now, this is quite interesting, because actually, this has worked brilliantly for us for virtually the whole of the last four million years. It's only been in the last little bit of a nanosecond that this has started to cause a problem. And the reason has been because most of what we've done throughout that time has been what behavioral scientists call algorithmic. It's this stuff. It's the automated processes. Even since the start of the Industrial Revolution, our work has been algorithmic. It's been follow a set of instructions for a defined outcome. Yeah? And in fact, I would suggest that most of your work, think back to when you started work in your first job, and you would have, they would have given you a set of instructions, told you what to do, and when you, or if you hit something that you weren't sure about, you'd go back and say, what should I do? You'd get more instructions, you'd go back and do it. Yes? So if you think about your first job, what percentage of your work do you think would have been algorithmic? Sorry? 70%. 70%? 90. 90? Yeah, pretty high. Pretty high. And for the vast majority of the Industrial Revolution, we have worked in command and control structures where the people at the top do the thinking, the people at the bottom do the doing. Isn't it? That's the way it's worked. The interesting thing is, in recent times, this has started to change. What's happened is that now, nowadays we're expecting people to do more and more of what behavioral si scientists call heuristic tasks. Now these are tasks that are undefined processes with an imprecise outcome. The fact that you are all here today is because you're doing heuristic tasks. You haven't come here to get a set of instructions to go back to your organization with and to implement by rote, have you? You've come along to be curious, to listen, to, to pick up some ideas and some concepts. And what you take away, all of you will take away different things. And when you get back to your organizations, you'll probably apply this or apply that, and you won't be sure what the outcome will be, but you'll test it and work it out. This is heuristic thinking. So what percentage of your work now would you say is heuristic rather than algorithmic? 80%. Yeah, wow. Big swing. Now, in organizations across the world, what we've been doing is we've been automating these things. We've got robots that can paint a car like the best spray painter ever could. We've got computers that monitor different things. We don't have to have people monitoring arrivals and departures. We've got systems that can do that. So more and more of the shift, what we want people to do in organizations is more of this, isn't it? We want people to do what once upon a time was the preserve of senior managers. 
In fact, the world is changing so fast that senior management now realize that they need to push down that sort of the heuristic task lower down in the organization. We need people thinking for themselves, making their own minds up. I'm going to give you an example of the difference between heuristic and uh, algorithmic. This was some work that was done in uh, Elkin and Goldberg's labs in the late 90s. Now, so if I show you this image, and now I'll show you two other images, which of these, A or B, do you like the most? Put your hands up if you like A better than B. Okay, hands up if you like B better than A. Okay, who's right? <laughs> Nobody. There is no right answer. It's just what you like. Now, when I asked you that question, did you feel yourself thinking about it? Did you think of something? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. I quite like I quite like red, but I also like dots. You know. Yeah. Okay. A different question. Having seen this image, which image is most like this? Is it A or B? E. A. Is it B? <laughs> There's always one. Anyway. Yeah. You don't have to think about it. Now, interestingly, when you wire people up again with this, when you ask them the first question, boom! It's these areas of the brain again. Heuristic thinking requires these parts of the brain. It's the frontal lobes, heavily implicated. This area with limited capacity. The bit that you can't do that much with. When you ask an algorithmic question, by you spending a lot of money on helping me get there. But on the other hand, I could go from up here. I could become world class. In your organization, I could become the world's best right-handed person, maybe. By saying, forget the left hand. Feel confident about the fact that you don't use that. It doesn't matter. What we'll do is we'll find other people who can do the left-handed stuff. That's OK. We'll get them. So what you're doing is you're actually narrowing the scope, but you're broadening across the spread of people. That's pretty challenging, though, because to work with this broad spread of people who are experts in different areas, I don't know if you've ever worked with experts, but experts are quite tough to work with because they're all different. They're all different. So how do you get corporate alignment when you've got this much diversity? Any thoughts? Yeah, by, by standing one word. By, what? by standing one word. Make yeah, simplify goals. Yeah. One word. Yeah, okay, what else? Ask the person again. How do you get alignment when you've got this much diversity in your organization? Ask questions. Ask questions? Yeah. No. <laughs> do you know what? Storytelling is one of the best ways. In fact, I would suggest it is probably the best way, short of setting fire to the building, because then there's a common purpose. Seriously, you get alignment if you set fire to a building. Everybody runs out. But, you know, fear creates alignment. But if you don't want to do it through fear, storytelling is the best way to create alignment. But this is not in the, normally the corporate way. Let me give you an example, though. There was a guy who was the managing director of a company called Credit Card Sentinel. And he wanted to, he was new into the job, and he wanted to get alignment around, the, around where we're going with the business. He spent ages trying to write the corporate strategy. Whoops, hang on. We're just, we've just been realigned. Trying to, trying to rewrite the, the, the strategy. In the end, he threw this document away because he thought it was complete rubbish. And he just found he'd written yet another boring document, a mission statement, purpose document, you know, all that sort of stuff. And instead, he spent 20 minutes doing this. That. He spent 20 minutes. He drew that. That was it. And actually, that said everything that they needed to do. It was just a picture of what it is we're doing. Look, technology, innovation, growth, you know, their customers, uh, success, delivering the best, work as a team, you know, trust, communicating. This was just the best mission statement ever. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. This is an organization. This company also became one of the you know, 100 best places to work for in the UK. It was outstanding. They had this printed on mouse mats, on beakers, on, you know, it was all over the place. Uh, because actually, you can align to this. You can say, what's my story? How does, how does my story go? Yeah, that looks good. I like this. That fits with me. I can understand how that gels. Can I gel my story with a 55-page with a mission statement document? No. You know, Martin Luther King never said, I have a business plan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people aligned behind, I had a dream. Did he say anything? No. 
about little children holding hands. I mean, what what's this guy on? But you know, but everybody lies behind it because they think this fits with my vision. So you know, this whole notion of storytelling really works, and actually, neurologically, it's proven. It's a great TED talk by this guy. Actually, if you go and look on TED talk, Yuri's a brilliant guy. Really has been looking at the at what happens neurologically when we tell stories. What we find is it doesn't matter what the culture of the people is, what the language of the story is, it doesn't make any difference. The same regions of the brain light up in all those people. Suddenly you're getting alignment despite the differences in character, personality, all those things. We're getting neurological alignment. We convey expressions of fear, hope, aspirations. If you've been to the, the cinema when you know everybody bursts into tears at the same time. You know, wouldn't it be great if you could do that in an organisation? Have everybody crying at the same time. <laughs> exactly. We've just seen there was a massive redundancy program. <laughs> You're all losing your jobs. Happy days. Yeah. But again, if you want that out of the positivity, you can't get the same thing. But when working with existing employees, what we do in our when we do training programs, all of our training programs begin with the individual and build towards the organisation. So it's important to us to start with, who have we got here? What are your strengths? What is it? Where are you in your flow? What are you energized by? And where's your energy and motivation? And how does that build towards that place? And we don't teach people anything. What we do is we facilitate the organizational conversation. I always say there are two elements in a training course. There's content and context. We provide the content. You provide the context. And I don't want, know what your story is when you walk into the room. I don't know that. So my job is to trip you through this thought process so that it resonates with you. When you do this as a, more of, of a story flow, and it's, it's not, we don't start once upon a time, long, long ago, but you know, in terms of putting it in as a story, what you find is that everybody goes away feeling that the course was tailored for them. You might have 30 people in the room, but it feels personalized. Why? Because they were running their narrative at that time, they can see how it fits. Let me give you an example of the impact that this can have. We recently ran a, a program for, um, there were basically first line managers in Jaguar, the car company, Jaguar Land Rover. These, uh, they vary from people who, in the manufacturing plant, they might have 300 staff, to technical specialists with no staff at all. Huge range of people. Some of them got PhDs in paint specialisms and things like that. I mean, there are people there who design tire trends. I mean, it's a huge diversity, fascinating uh, manufacturing environment to work in. But what we did with this is we always started off by saying, you've got to pay for this course, basically, and I expect you to deliver a minimum of a tenfold return on investment within 12 months. That's tenfold bottom line impact. So that normally equates to about £20,000 within 12 months. Exactly. Not that much, really, in terms of how am I going to deliver that. But, so you've got people thinking already to say, at the end of this, I'm going to have to put together a, a personal a, a action plan and a business action plan. I'm going to have to do something different as a result of this, which is the only point of training in the first place. Look at the results. My shining star pupil is a guy called Tony Jordan. He tells me that it was a result of that course that he did this. Personally, I'm uh, flattered. It's a result of him. I didn't do this. But what he went away with, he worked in engine testing. Uh, they inherited the testing process from Ford. Ford testing process was hugely expensive. Engine development is about 60% of the development cost of a new car. Uh, so, and what Tony thought is, if we did it by on an exception basis, instead of the the traditional Ford way that we've been using, it will be a lot faster, a lot more efficient. This is very, this is mission critical stuff. So he put together a presentation, he gave him the inspiration because he saw how his story could align with this. He took it to the organization, he printed, presented it to Ralph Speth on the main board of Jaguar Land Rover, it got adopted, it is saving them nine million pounds a year. And Tony was only responsible for gasoline engine. He then got promoted, so he was also over diesel engine production, and since he's been promoted again, he's now a, a heads of worldwide engine production for Jaguar Land Rover. I didn't give him that knowledge. That was what he brought as his context. But it was the notion that I can now see how to break through from this. I can see the alignment of how my story can develop within this organization. Spencer, he told me at the end of the, at the, end of the course, he said, actually, you know what, I like my job. I don't know that I really want to progress within the organization. Well, that's fine. That's fine. You can do that. So 
kind of surprised because I think you've got a lot of potential. And he went away and we had our first coaching session. He said, you know, I've been thinking about this, this virtualization stuff. He actually, he had a really cool job because he worked in um, what they call vehicle dynamics, which is where you take the cars, early production, well, late, say, production cars, and you drive them around a the racetrack sideways and skidding off the road, and then you fine tune the suspension. So we spent all these days screaming around the racetrack in cars. It's great, honestly, brilliant. And in the winter, by the way, they go to Finland and, dr and do the same stuff on ice. It's just a, what? It's just the greatest job in the world. But anyway, but anyway, he doesn't do that anymore because he got promoted. Because he created this thing they called the virtual hub to pull together all the virtualization business, save money and, re and reduce development time. This guy Mike was uh, involved in uh, the paint development. Now, because of for some strange reason, I don't know why, Jaguar have a two-stage paint process, which meant they couldn't do metallic white paint, and yet 49% of all Land Rovers sold all over the world are white. So metallic white costs no more than base white, but you can charge customers more for it. So he, he decided, I'm going to have another go at cracking that. And he did. He cracked it working with DuPont, the paint manufacturers, or the, and uh, as a result, they reckon that's increased annual profits by 45 million. These are just, and this is not because I did this. This is because they have that opportunity to see how their narrative, their narrative, their story of their life, fit within the, story, within the context of the organization. Okay. So to conclude, my take on this is that storytelling is a crucial thing. It's the one thing that we can do that can really align us neurologically. It's the one thing that gets consensus and joins understanding. And therefore, it's a useful process within organizational life. It should be interwoven with everything we do. And also, fix the education system. Thank you. Very much. Time for any questions? Yes. Uh, most of the people are. Some people are not visual. How do you handle the storytelling when you're not visual? So when you're not visual. Yeah. When you're not visual. Well, by auditory, I guess. You know, I mean, stories don't have to be sort of pictorial like that. But I think you know, a lot of chief executives just do, do that. I mean, just compare it with politicians. Politicians don't. Politicians tell stories. You know, there's a lot that they can learn from each other. It's those sort of differences. Uh, look at those inspirational speeches by um, particularly people in the military. Uh, you know, you look at that, that great speech by Tim Collins before, you know, how do you inspire somebody to follow you, you know, into battle? People will follow a leader, they don't follow a manager. You know, you don't follow a business plan. You know, that's, that's the part of the problem with the military. It's in peacetime, they lose bucket loads of money because they haven't got any good managers because they have to recruit leaders. So, yeah. Share about your program. Pitch. Sorry? The program that you have. Yes. Yes. How we do that? Can we pick that up later? Because it's not really the theme of the subject, but the topic area. But we'll speak afterwards. Yeah. When the stories of the top team is in conflict, how do you handle it? When the stories of the top team are in conflict. Yeah, sack the wrong ones. Uh, I think this is. Well, it's a very interesting thing. Senior teams very rarely have these conversations. They sit together, they have the front for meeting, bang, 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 business, business, business all the time. I think what you have to do is take them out of that context and start to actually explore this. The starting point for me, unfortunately, most businesses start with mission, goals, profit, those sort of things. What they should come back to is what is our purpose? If you start with purpose, the rest flows quite reasonably. I do quite a lot of strategy work with people. You start with purpose. It's amazing how hard it is for organisations. What is our purpose? What What are we doing that makes the world a better place? Sure, I have a question in the library. Sorry. I have a question in the library. Yes. Is there any research to establish the impact of the brain after you get married? The, the impact <laughs> on the brain of marriage. But the question was: Is there any Is there any research which looks at the impact on the brain of marriage? Uh, no. <laughs> but actually, I have this interesting theory. Uh, what we find is that our profiling work, we find that, we find that peop couples, people often marry opposites. Which actually, when you think about it, would be natural to form whole brain family units. But I also have this theory that people have affairs with people who have similar brain profiles. And if anybody can, <laughs> and if anybody can tell me where I can get a grant for the research, I'd be really interested. <laughs> okay, that's probably a good note to close on. It was a seriously. 
If you have any uh, other further follow-up questions, then please do come and stop by our booth. I don't know if we have, are we, are we limited for time at all? I don't know, who's the timekeeper here? They're gone. Okay. And because we can carry on, there's nobody to say stop. Yeah. So uh, the question is now that we uh, stated the theories about married couples and affairs. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you a story. I can't tell you a story. The, the, the other day, of course, it was Valentine's Day. And, so, and I was here in India, and my wife's back home in England. So I hid a Valentine's card for her. This was, for me, this was good. So I hid it. So I sent her a text message so that when she woke up, she'd see this thing and say, go and find this Valentine's card. So she was very pleased. Anyway, then, then the, the post arrived. And a box arrived through the post, and she thought, this is one of those boxes, like those mail-ordered boxes of chocolates. And it, but strangely, it was addressed to me. But she thought, well, it was probably just my account. So she quickly opened it. Lo and behold, it's a box of these things called hotel chocolate. chocolates. They're very exclusive. They're lovely, quite expensive. And she thought, oh, Alistair's such a lovely husband. What a nice person. And then she read the card, and it said, to Alistair, from Rosie. <laughs> And they were a thank you gift from a friend of mine. Uh, you know, couldn't you just wait one more day? Uh, <laughs> anyway, so when, I, so when, I, when the time difference called up and I phoned her and said happy Valentine's Day, she wasn't in the best mood. <laughs> and guess what? She'd eaten the bloody chocolates. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. Uh, Rosie is a coach who was nominated for an award here, and she's won an award. So she was sending me a box of chocolates to say thank you for her nomination. Okay, thank you ever so much for listening. Thank you. Very much.